you know, at the end of the day, like the guiding light through this whole fucking thing was just, are we doing what's right for the seller? And I bring this up because there may be a person watching this that I had a recent conversation with that was frustrated when we did well. They were the seller and we had a deal that went well and we made a little more than we were expecting. And in that conversation, she brought up how, oh, you can lose, you're a young person, you're already wealthy, blah, blah, blah. And I asked her to think about those situations when I buy a property and we lose money. I've never had a seller call me back and renegotiate to make sure that we made money. And in that moment, I said to myself, some deals go exactly the way we want and we make extra and you can't control it and we have to just be happy about it. And then there are other times where we have to stand on our moral principle and say, when I look in the mirror and I say, I help people, do I help people when it's not easy? And this was an example of when helping this lady not only didn't make us any money, but also lost us a significant amount of money and we had complete right to just walk away. But we did it anyways, because to us, our core value is taking care of people. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Pursuit of Property podcast. Kate and I are here today with a deal review. This will be a different deal review than some. We've always claimed we share the winners and the losers. And today we are going to share how we lost money on a wholesale deal. The least risky form of investing. Yeah, dude. It's been a little while since we've done a deal review. We've been waiting for the right one to talk about. Either both positive or negative. And like you said, today we're bringing, uh, we're we're pulling back the curtain and showing showing uh, one of the recent losses we've had. I know um, one of our biggest losses we've shared on the podcast was way back when we sold one of our rental properties Ooh. in Indiana. That was uh, above a ten thousand dollar loss. But yeah, you make an interesting point, man. We talk about wholesaling. Wholesaling is branded as the easiest way to get started in real estate investing, little to no risk. Anyone can do it. And we've got a team of 15 plus people with years and years and years of experience. And we're bringing you guys a deal today that inevitably we lost on. (sighs) (laughs) Dude, do you remember me going through this whole saga and the day we got to the closing table, I was so excited to be done. And it was just, this was a wild experience. So we're going to have to roll back the tape here. I don't have, I don't have, I'll just pull it up. I'll pull up the CRM. Let's pull it up. Oh, wait, it won't be on the app because it's closed. No, dude. Just pull up your laptop. The uh, chronological time would be very, very nice. Um, But let's just start with the lead coming in. We had a call from the lead. Um, and pretty normal sale, right? Wants to sell for a discount, home needs some work, doesn't have a lot of money and just wants to be done with the project, already has an X place lined up and everything goes pretty smooth. Oh, thank you. Wow. Look at this. If you're on YouTube, look at this first class service. I get the laptop thrown up. That's it. Um, okay. It's going to take me so long to scroll back to the start because there were so many notes, but Well, and even we can just provide a little bit of context. Um, This property is over in Modesto. Yeah. And if you guys know Modesto, we're over here in Fresno. Um, It's not super close. You've got quite a bit of a haul of a drive all the way over to Modesto. Um, We've got two active fix and flip projects over in Modesto. Modesto is a market that we've been interested in for a long time and wanting to break into that market. Um and so, I mean, I think these three deals, we've had maybe another one or two um, more throughout the year so far, but a market we've wanted to kind of solidify ourselves as buyers and investors in. Yeah. So, I mean, let's speed run the start here because that's yeah. not really the problem, but yeah, there were there were learning lessons along the way. And in this, we're going to say we lost, but really we learned. Um, 
Because at the end Good of the day, point. there was a lot of opportunities to learn. So Lee comes in off of direct mail, right? So she got a check letter from us. Um, the check letter was for two thirty nine seven forty one. Um, seller owes about two twelve, and she was hoping to keep fifty thousand in her pocket, right? Whew. So that says two sixty five. We did a great job at the start here. We went out on the appointment. We ended up locking up the contract for, and I just want to scroll down because we went on the appointment and signed it there on the appointment the next day. Hmm. Um, and we signed it for, two fifteen. So seller owed two twelve. We put in a contract for two fifteen. Correct. Uh, statement showed she owed two oh nine mm, at the time. Uh, so we signed it for two fifteen. Right, left a little bit for her to take home. Um, but we felt pretty good that this house was worth somewhere in the mid three hundred thousands when it was done. Curious, just to. You know, before obviously we get to the main learning lessons, but making the jump down from when she wants to put fifty grand in her pocket, two sixty, two seventy, then being able to negotiate down to two fifteen, what did how what did that look like with her? It always goes back to motivation, right? She was trying to get out of a property she didn't want to own anymore. She had had some issues keeping up on it. She was out of cash to maintain it. Um, but at the same time, this is where the first learning lesson was. We didn't have enough understanding of what motivating factors were playing in the background, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just knew that the house needed some work. We walked it. The house didn't look horrible. Definitely need a little bit. But the first real red flag didn't pop up until we had already signed the contract. And to clarify, uh, signed for 214. 214. Okay. And... You know, when when Marissa came back from the appointment and Marissa's on our team, she at the time she was very new uh, to going on appointments by herself. She started showing me the photos. And as I was looking through the photos, I was like, hey, is that smoke damage on the the detached garage? Because the detached garage, the whole inside was just down to the studs. It didn't look burned it looked like they were framing it out to make it an ADU and just ran out of money, hmm. right? But when I saw the smoke damage, that was the first warning sign. Looking back, I wish I had taken it more seriously. Um, and I asked Marissa, I said, hey, did she ever mention anything about a fire? And she was like, oh, I, I didn't ask, but she didn't say anything. And so we opened escrow and we said, you know what? You know, let's call her back and ask. Let's get a septic inspection done. And let's get the prelim, right? The prelim is going to get us, you know, if there's any debts, liens, anything like that, it will show any issues with the county or the city. So we just said, look, we're going to get a lot of information very quickly. Yeah. In the meantime, I started calling around uh, to find end buyers. And so the plan was to, wholesale. to clarify always to wholesale. It was okay. always to wholesale okay. because we got it at what we felt was a pretty good price. Yeah. And so I used this program called Investor Base to find I found four buyers um, that were interested in the project and we did a good job. We started bidding them, right? We got their offers. We ended up saying, hey, this guy that we've worked with in the past, 240, okay? And he was he ended up being the person that we trusted the most and he was paying what we felt was a fair price. So you look at that, 240 to 214, what is that? 26 grand. 26,000 dollars. That's a pretty good deal, yeah. right? That's that's right in line with what we would hope to make. Yep. So we get the septic inspection and the septic inspection came back good. And I was like, dude, this is going great. All I have to do is get my guy to go walk it. We're going to be smooth sailing. Um, and then the prelim came back. And this is where I think a lot of people don't ever read it. But on the prelim, it came back with this... Um, I'm going to butcher what term it is, but it was essentially a lien from the county that wasn't like a standard lien. And it like title was like, Hey, you need to call the county, see what's going on. So we reach out to the county and it turns out that in the detached garage, there had been a fire that the fire department was aware of. And the seller after it burned, instead of contacting the county, just started gutting the place and going through repairing it, which is why to us it didn't look burned, but to the county, 
they were requiring that you pull permits every step of the way. Oh, geez. So we walked into a halfway done project that the city was going to be upset with. That started causing a big issue. And again, I guess going back, the learning lesson here was this was not information we were aware of, right? And there's some times where we have to read between the lines with the seller when they're saying, yeah, it needs work, blah, blah, blah. Maybe we could have pressed and said, if you had any issues with the county or with the city, right? And maybe that information would have come up. But at a bare minimum, when we saw the smoke damage, we should have been quicker to say, wait, 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 what's going on? Was there a fire? And if not, why is there smoke damage to the side of the door? Did the did the prelim have a dollar amount attached to the lien or was that only f- figured out after contact contacting the county? So it had a hundred dollar lien and we were like, that's not the big deal. But then it was really that we had to then get permits and everything for the entire construction, yeah. which blows Crap. up the budget because that, yeah. that house was not going to need permits or anything <clears throat> before that. So at this point, you know, We had sent the assignment contract out to this person we knew and he was ghosting my calls, dodging my calls, not getting back to me. And I was like, there's something going on. And, um, you know, his, his requirement was I need to go walk the property. So he goes, walks the property. He says, yeah, everything's good, but now I need my brother to walk the property. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, right? So we didn't get all the decision makers at once. Mm. That again, that falls back on me. I should have been a little more clear on getting all the decision makers. And then ultimately he decides, no, I can't do it. (sighs) And we had an originally a 30 day escrow and we were about 40 days into that escrow. And I was thinking, hey. At the point of getting this this, out from the buyer. Because he was somebody that had previously closed deals very quickly. So I was like, well, even if it's a last second thing, he can fund and record. It's his own money. It's quick. Blah, blah, blah. Now he cancels. And I'm like, dude, I'm 40 days into a 30-day escrow. I don't even have a buyer lined up. And the house is in way worse shape. So we're not going to be flipping this, right? We're not in touch with the county over there. We don't have any experience with this problem. Yeah. So this was like not a deal that you want to try to take down. Right. I always talk with coaching students. You don't want to like take on too many new things at once. So Mm -hmm. we're flipping a couple properties in Modesto. So we we're starting to get the hang of it. But at the same time, like this isn't just a basic flip now. Now it's going all through county and permitting and all that, which could take quite a bit more time and effort. So at this point, we're 40 days in, we don't have a buyer. We now have the county telling us that there's all this extra work. And it was just kind of like, it it put back into perspective, okay, assigning contracts, you can't control everything. Well, and I think this is a good pause moment too, because I'm curious how you guys handle the conversation because we also had a conversation um, recently where we were selling a property to bring money back into the business, right? And we were also purchasing a new property. And we were going to roll those funds from the property we were selling to the property we were buying. So essentially, we needed to wait for this property to close before buying this one. And the closing of property A got delayed and got delayed again and got delayed again, which is holding up this escrow, right? Where we had a 30-day escrow, but now we're 35 days. Now we're close to 40 days. What did the conversation look like with the seller, especially as the seller's expectation is to close in 30 days. Is the seller all antsy? Is the seller like, what's going on? How was that conversation handled for this deal? I mean, it helped that she had lied to us um, at one point and pretty much said like, no, there wasn't a fire. Hmm. And then when we came back to her and said there was a fire, she owned up to it and we had a whole conversation about it. Um, So we refer back to that and we were like, look. We need due diligence. Like (laughs) we came to agreement and there was really important factual information with help. Like we're trying to get this closed, but we're not just going to buy this house mm. for the price you want with all this extra work. I mean, this is like $25,000 of added cost, but no $25,000 change in price. Yeah. And you don't have the route to go drop the price. So you need to kind of stick it out with us here. So at that point, like the the other domino that fell was, her mortgage came in higher than 209 
because she hadn't been paying her mortgage last payment. Oh, crap. So now her payment had gone up to 216. So we're like, well, you went from making some money to not making any money, and I can't control that, but I'll raise my price to pay off all the debt. So at least you don't have to come out of pocket, right? Yeah. So we signed it for 214. Now we're at like 216 something. And um, that was part of how we got her to stick along. It was like, look, we're not forcing you to come out of pocket. Like, we can tell you're in financial distress. We're trying to do what's right for you. But we're also trying to make sure that we don't make a horrible decision for ourselves. At that point, I went back to the buyers that had offered on the home. And I gave them the new information. And I said, hey, would you still be interested? Of the four buyers I met, the first guy walked already. Two other guys immediately dropped out of the race. And the third guy said... Actually, I just did a deal like this. Yeah, I'd still look at it. And I was like, no fucking way. Like in my head, I was like, there's no fucking way that of all the people that I could have called, we had somebody that just dealt with an exact situation like this. And he's like, yeah, um, you know, I've done this before. It can lead to a couple of hiccups, but yeah, I've done it. Like I even have a contact over there. So he jumped on the phone with the county and got a lot more information than I ever got. Because he had the right questions he, to ask. And he had done it and he knew the lady. And so he calls me back and he's like, hey, you know, I offered like uh, 235 before. He's like, with everything she told me, it's a lot of money. He's like, I can pay you guys like, you know, 217 or 218 or something. <sighs> and I was like, dude, I have this thing in contract at 216. I was like, I'm not even going to bullshit you. I'm $900 into inspections and I would like to pay my salesperson. And he's like, okay, I'll chip in a little here. And he threw out like, um, you know, we essentially got it so that we could get an assignment fee of 1900. So in the span of like four days, I went from thinking we were going to make 25,000 and that this guy we knew would close to like, okay, he's out now. The next best option is 1900. And at that point I looked at it and I just said, okay, I want to be done with this deal. It's a very hard project for us to take down ourselves because we yeah. talked about if we should do it. And I said, let's just assign it for 1900 So that's what we did at that point. Then we have to go through figuring out this whole county issue. Give me a second. I got to drink water. Yeah. And again, nineteen hundred of that $1,900 assignment fee... About half of that is just recouping what was already spent out of our pockets in escrow, paying for inspections to figure out that the septic was okay. So really... And we're not even accounting for marketing costs, which marketing <laughs> cost was like probably three grand. Yeah. Or gas cost or time into the deal. Yeah. So we're talking very basic <laughs> loss here. Um, at that point, we hit a couple roadblocks where the buyer knew how to do the process, but it takes time. So I mentioned there was a hundred dollar fee. Uh, in order to get hard money lending on the project, the hard money lender did not want that lien on the project. They didn't mm. care if it came back on the project, but when they funded, they did not want it there. Mm. So we negotiated with the county to give them the hundred dollar fee. They would do a temporary removal for 30 days. And in 30 days, the, the, the lien would go back on the house. Interesting. So the guy would have to still do all the work. Yeah. And our rationale to the county was, you want the house fixed. We want the house fixed. The only way we can get the financing to fix it is mm. if you work with us. Yeah. We will do the work. Give us 30 days to get the loan in place so that we can then do the work. Nice. So they did that. That took an extra two weeks to get that to go through because yeah. the county moves at their own pace. Of course. At this point, the seller is just losing it. She's frustrated. We're frustrated, right? Mm. We went from, hey, we're going to make a little money to, hey, you concealed information that drastically changed what we could potentially make, but we're already five, six weeks into this. And at the end of the day, we were just going by the guiding light of we were going to do what's right for the seller, which was we're just going to close out the deal. Even if we only make 1900 it is what it is. We're going to make sure she doesn't come out of pocket. And this is the third mistake. <laughs> Maybe the fourth. <laughs> I put it in an email to escrow that Pinnacle would pay whatever debt the seller owed on the property because we knew that the debt was racking up a little bit, a little bit each day yeah. that this dragged out. Yeah. And so it has a lot like what Guillermo, our buddy, does. He pays a per diem for every day he doesn't close. We kind of followed that model. And 
it was going well because we could calculate how much that would be. And it was like each day we were losing like 40 bucks, but we were still positive, right? And finally, we get to, I think, Thursday the 28th. So the league came in July 15th. We signed it the 16th. We're, I don't know, August 28th is because we're in September. So it was yeah. August 28th. The seller goes in to sign and signs with the notary and is like, great. And our team had done a good job of telling the seller, like, hey, you own the house until we call you and tell you that escrow's closed. Okay. You sign the deed, but it doesn't get recorded right away. Mm -hmm. Well, the seller signed on a Thursday. And because of the fire, her homeowner's insurance really didn't want this house as a liability. So they had instructed her, when you sell the house, turn off your insurance. She took that as, the day I signed to sell the house, shut off insurance. Oh. So Thursday, the 28th, I think, she shuts off insurance. Friday, the 29th, the mortgage company is notified that there's no insurance on the home. The mortgage company is not going to take that. And it's federal law that they can order insurance for you. So oh. they pay a 12-month premium for homeowner's insurance on Friday. We do not hear about it until Monday after the buyer has signed and we release to the county recorder's office to close. Everything's pretty much done. And we get an invoice from the mortgage company to escrow for $9,500. And it blew my mind because we had volunteered to pay the debt. Yeah. It was just, this was the whole situation was a learning opportunity. And I remember this was like Tuesday morning. I was so excited for this property to close. And you remember, I was like all excited. And then we got the email and my face must've just gone pale because I realized I had volunteered to already pay it. And I remember the buyer texting me, did you know the seller was short 9,500 bucks? And I was just like, I am so fucked because we were expecting it to be 40 bucks a day or so. And so we were calculating it was gonna be like three, 400 bucks. But we didn't know that this whole insurance thing would have happened. And at this point, we were signed to, you know, cover the seller's debt, what we thought at the time of 216. But now we get this 9,500. We're at 225.5, and our buyer is paying 19, like, let's 218, 218 ish. Um, 225. 500 minus 218 leaving us approximately needing to come to the table out of pocket 7500 bucks give or take <sighs> so now chronologically thinking of making 24000 or 26 or whatever it was then to 1900 now to in the red 7500 it was a big swing. And the conversation that you and I had was we need to do what's right by the seller. It's gone this far. And Jason was in Greece. And it really, the decision came back to you and me to just do whatever we felt was right. And we could have, I guess, stuck it out and been like, no, Mrs. Seller, you screwed it up. But at the end of the day, it's already on title. It's not like we could really force anything. Yeah. Um, so we had the mortgage, we had our escrow officer call the mortgage company and they removed some of the fees, but they said, Hey, this is an insurance claim or like an insurance policy. Um, you know, money's going to come back to you, but it's going to take some time, but it needs to get paid in full now. So we tried to negotiate for the insurance portion of it, which was about 3,500 to come back to escrow so that they could pay us out instead of it going to the seller's hands. Okay. But they said, no, it has to go back to the seller. So we essentially went from making money to giving her money um, to do this deal. So it didn't go how you'd plan. Um, but I called the seller. I said, look, uh, and oh, I have to give credit where credit's due. Our buyer volunteered to give us a thousand bucks extra. He heard about what wow. happened. And he was like, dude, this is a relationship game. Like, wow. I know that this is a skinnier deal for me, but I'll throw in a, a thousand bucks to try to help out, which wow. shout out to our guy, Ben. Um, 
But the seller and I talked, I said, look, this is what happened. When you canceled your insurance, they bought new insurance. She got very upset, obviously. Yeah. I had to explain to her that, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. I already paid for it. But that money that's going to come back to you, I need you to get it back to me. It's that's my money. But it was a mistake. I paid the cost, but I would like to get the reimbursement back. And to her credit, she actually is is cooperating with us. So I think in the grand scheme of things, we wired $5,600 to close an assignment deal. Um, we're out $900 for the inspection. We're out $500 for the earnest money deposit. So you're at $1,400. We're out uh, $5,600 to close escrow. And we're going to get about $3,100 back from that reimbursement. So all said and done, about seven weeks of grueling work. Uh, and grueling work, I mean mentally, not necessarily like anything else. Yeah. And all that to lose four grand on top of the marketing cost, which was probably another three. So, And it's hard, too, because of the issue, like you shared, where the insurance company would only reimburse the original owner, right? The seller of the property. There's no easy way to enforce, hey, Mrs. Seller, this check's made out to you when you get this $3,500 to pay it back to us. Like there's, it, that's, that would be a very, it's a very hard to enforce that when checks made out to the seller. Of course, you could probably go to co- like, go down this whole road of trying to recollect that 3500 but you'd spend more than 3500 in legal fees, probably just trying to get that 3500 back. I did a really good job of how to phrase that to the seller because by the time I told her, we had already paid it. And essentially, the way I phrased it was, hey, you got invoiced an extra 9500 bucks. <clears throat> we stepped in and negotiated it down to 5600 bucks. Then we paid your $5,600 debt outside of any agreement we've ever had because we know how bad you want this to be done. We're not going to ask you to pay us back any of it. But you are going to get a reimbursement from the insurance company and that's our money. And I'm asking you in the same way that I'm trying to make this a win for you, that you wire that back to us so we can call ourselves square. And she freaked out at first, like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. And I said, don't worry about the 5,600. I paid it. But when you get a check for $3,000 that has your name on it, know that that's what I paid and that's my money and I'm asking you to return it. Hmm. And she seemed to be on board with it. But, you know, at the end of the day, like the guiding light through this whole fucking thing was just, are we doing what's right for the seller? And I bring this up because there may be a person watching this that I had a recent conversation with that was frustrated when we did well. They were the seller and we had a deal that went well and we made a little more than we were expecting. And in that conversation, she brought up how, oh, you can lose, you're a young person, you're already wealthy, blah, blah, blah. And I asked her to think about those situations when I buy a property and we lose money. I've never had a seller call me back and renegotiate to make sure that we made money. And in that moment, I said to myself, some deals go exactly the way we want and we make extra and you can't control it and we have to just be happy about it. And then there are other times where we have to stand on our moral principle and say, when I look in the mirror and I say, I help people, do I help people when it's not easy? And this was an example of when helping this lady not only didn't make us any money, but also lost us a significant amount of money. And we had complete right to just walk away. But we did it anyways, because to us, our core value is taking care of people. And so it made me feel a little bit better. And I I look at it, it's not a loss. It's a lot of learning opportunities. I mean, how many did I list there? There was like four or five opportunities to learn and we lost about four or five grand. So... It's the cost of an education in our business. Ties back to the principle. I put it simply, we talk about this a lot in our sphere of investors. We just talk about people over profits, dude. And it's a lot easier to say that 
than to actually do it and back it up. And I think this deal in this scenario is a perfect example of putting people over profits. Yeah. And sh- that lady that made the comment that, oh, you're wealthy, you can lose. She's exactly right. We could afford to take this loss. If we could not afford to take the loss, we sure as shit wouldn't have because we got 15 people's families to feed. But our business has done well this year. We've lost on a couple deals. This will be one of the few that we lose on. And when we lose on them, they're great opportunities for us to not only take a deep dive into where we made serious mistakes and take accountability accountability for it. It also gives us the opportunity to share it to the podcast, yeah. the coaching students, the young people in the business that think, hey, when I sign up to sign up per- a person's home, I'm no longer responsible if things go wrong. And we always, always, always say that like when you're signing an assignment contract, you better be willing to make it work. And in this situation, we weren't willing to pay the price to take on the risk. So if we're not going to do it, we're not backing out. We're assigning it to somebody else and we're paying them to take the risk. And guess what? Ben, I hope that you make money on that deal. I hope you make 40, 50,000 bucks because I know it's going to be a heavy lift. Yeah. But I'm also grateful that he stepped in. He did what he said he would do. He even chipped in an extra thousand bucks to try to help us out. That's the relationship game in this business. And at a bare minimum, even though we didn't make money on this deal, I guarantee we do another deal with Ben that does make some money because he now knows that when we're working with sellers, we're trying our best to take care of the seller. And he'll understand that we're not always about squeezing every penny out of the end buyer. We're out of the seller. We're about creating something that works for everybody. Win-win. Even if it means sometimes we take an L. Yeah, dude. I think it all ties back to... We, we started with just talking about wholesaling in general. I think that's the frustrating piece of a lot of the content that you see on social media, on YouTube, from these gurus who say, hey, guys, this is what wholesaling a property is. Low risk to no risk, high reward. You just sign a paper and you can make 10 grand. I think it's super, super important. You made the great point of sharing all of the things that go into a wholesale, the risk involved, the people involved. It's not as easy as just signing a piece of paper and getting 10, 20, 30 grand into your bank account. And I think by pulling back the curtain and helping share this deal breakdown and this deal review, I hope it helps the people on the other end of the podcast, really sit down and understand that real estate investing is risky. It's inherently risky. And to have the core purpose of putting people over profits, that's when you see the success in this business. You can't make money without risk. And if you hear somebody say you can, I promise you that they're either lying or immoral. And I don't want to affiliate myself with any investor who would put themselves in that situation and would walk away. Now, do I think every investor should pay the 5,600 bucks? No. At the end of the day, if the seller made a mistake, sometimes the seller has to figure out how to pay for it. But in this situation, we did what we felt was right, which was the escrow dragged out. The deal went a little, a little sideways. We knew the seller's financial situation. She could not afford to fix this. And instead of dragging our buyer out and dragging the seller out, we solved the problem quickly and we we chalked it up as a learning opportunity. But I don't want to be affiliated with the people that give wholesalers such a bad name because their idea is you can make promises to sellers that you knowingly will walk away from if you were given pushback. Like we don't sign deals unless we feel very confident we can make it work. And if something like this pops up, we renegotiate, right? If she had room to go down on price, we would have gone down on price. But at the end of the day, she didn't. And we had already made a commitment to figure this out. From the whole, from the start, we were looking at what can we do to help the seller? When the price went from 25,000 to 1,900, we said, what can we do to help the seller? And when the price went from 1,900 to minus 
you know, 5,600 or when we added it all up, 7,500, the same guiding principle was there, which was what can we do to help the seller in this situation? And what can we do to learn from this so that we don't lose money again? I want to play through a quick scenario real quick because you made the comparison earlier that we had the resources, we had the experience as a company to have the ability to back up our word and back up our purpose of putting people over profits. If this was four to five years ago, when we were on our own, very limited resources, very limited money, we're new investors, and this same exact situation popped up, or a new investor listening encounters this scenario where they do not have the ability to perform. What would you say if it was you four or five years ago or to the new investor who can't, even if they want to, perform? You weren't bitching when you were making 25000 whether or not the seller did something to cause an issue, you're the professional who should have been involved when she went to go cancel that insurance. And you can stop that by being actively talking to her. And she would have told you, insurance is pushing me to cancel my insurance. And you could have said, don't cancel your insurance. I'm telling you, it will cause issues. Wait until we close. And if you fuck that up, you have to take extreme ownership and I guess the only thing that I can think of that I would have done different is I would have asked the buyer to pay more and I would have either structured a payment plan with the buyer to pay him back or sometimes just like this guy did, generosity strikes the heart. They understand where you're coming from and maybe they they chip in, right? But I mean, fuck it, dude. You were not bitching when you were going to make 25000 I guess he signed up for a restaurant job for a couple months to pay it back because at the end of the day, you were, you were signed up to make money when it was easy. Now that it's hard and you're not making money, you need to still be accountable to the decision you made to make a commitment to the seller that she would not come out of pocket for this sale. Again, she screwed up. She plays a part, but our team plays a bigger part since we're the professionals that should have educated her not to make that mistake. And I love you backing that up with extreme ownership. Um, I don't know if we've... I think we did do Mm -hmm. a book review a while back. And I know it's been a while since we've done a book review. We've got one in the works, which will be great to bring those back. But I I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think you've got to look at yourself and look at the person you are in the mirror and the person and the investor that you want to be. And I think extreme ownership is, is that perfect piece to tie back to and look yourself in the mirror and ask what kind of person and what kind of investor do I want to be if I'm in this for the long haul. And I've had two sellers that I worked with come back and say horrible things about my character. And the first time it happened, it hurt really bad because I didn't have enough examples to go back to where I lost. I had been lucky enough to have not lost very much. The second time it happened, I lost on a few deals. And I had the ability to say that, yes, Mrs. Seller, you can call me all these horrible things, but I know where my core purpose is coming from, which is helping people. I know my business intentions are to make money. And whether I'm making money or making a mistake and having to learn the lesson, I'm sticking to my word. And when I tell you I'll pay you this price, I'm holding out and I will do it. And... That does not waver because of the dollar sign. Guys, a ton of learning lessons in here for this. I think a lot of very important, you know, core values, learning lessons, um, just ways to help you be a better investor because you made another great comparison. It's, It's a lot easier when you're making money. But your character shows when your back's up against the wall and you're not making money. And it sucks. Don't hear us saying it didn't suck to write that check. (laughs) 
but we did it anyways. Yeah. And all I ask is that if you're going to be making offers to sellers, that you think critically about your offer before you make it, and then you you vow to yourself that no matter what happens, you will do what you can to help the seller. And I'm not saying you're a bad person if they lie to you and they say the well's good and the well breaks. I totally get having to make adjustments. But if you knew that information and you made that offer, don't you dare think about price reducing. You knew the well was bad. You're not going back to the seller changing the price just because you're not making money now. That's it, man. Make a commitment. If your word's not bond, get out of the business. Boom. That was Aaron, Her- uh, not Aaron Hernandez, uh, Aaron <laughs> Velasquez. <laughs> Aaron, Vla- great guest we had on a couple episodes. Talked ago. about your word is everything. That's it, man. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in to this episode. Like we mentioned, we've got a great book review coming up for our real estate agents out there also listening. Here in a couple of weeks, we have some great guests coming on on how they're adapting to the market, yes. how they are figuring out ways to make money especially these past few months where interest rates have been high and really just figuring out ways to pivot and still succeed in this business. So stay tuned. We've got a couple great episodes coming up and we'll see you next week. See you next week, guys.